Welcome to church. We are glad you decided to join us. Um, if this is your first time with us at First Fairhope, we'd love to get in contact with you and just let us let you know a little bit more about our church. So if you'll take out your cell phone and type the number on the screen, and you're going to type welcome and send it to that number, and we'd love to just talk to you a little bit. This is our last Thursday evening service. So the next service that we will have will be at 11 o'clock on September 13th. Um, so our 11 o'clock service will no longer be happening on Thursday. This is the last one. Um, most Bible study classes will be meeting back as well. And this coming Wednesday, we have limited activities back on campus for everyone from adults to preschool. So check out the website. It has all the details and who will be meeting in the time frame um, is 6.30 to 7.30. Um, we're excited to begin gathering the entire family of believers back together. So um, let's stand and worship together. If you'll bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be in your house today, worshiping you. And even if we're at home, Lord, I pray that we're really able to just put away all the distractions and stand before you and give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise that you are due. Father, we thank you for sending your son to the cross to die for us. But then not only did he die for us, but he rose to life and he's bringing us to life with him. Thank you, Father. I pray that now we worship you in spirit and in truth, in our minds, in our hearts, in our souls. I pray as pastor brings the word that you move in our hearts to change us to look more like you. There's a lot of stuff that we need to work on, at least I do. Um, so Father, I pray that you continue molding us to be the sons and daughters that you have called us to be, to shine your light in this world, in this dark world. Lord, we love you, and it's in your precious son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Stand to our feet. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall Never fail me yet Waiting for change, God Waiting for change to
Amen, amen. Lift up a praise. Mighty shout to our God always keeps his promises. And welcome to church. Welcome that we are gathered together today to celebrate God the Most High, the one who never fails, never breaks his promises. And matter of fact, right now, as, as music is going on and preaching about to happen, as a truck being loaded as we speak and getting ready to bring hope, uh, bring love, bring care, bring mercy uh, to people who feel like there is no hope. Literally those who have lost everything in recent hurricane, those who are wondering what next, where do I go, what do I do, what direction do we even take? And then God's people, that God's church would rise up and that we would step in and show the love, grace, and mercy that he has for them. So as simple as our church has been, as just giving something simple like cleaning supplies or whatever we're able to give to be able to send hope to a world that definitely during this time for those. Praise God, we were spared from that. We would be wondering and hoping and really needing that our brothers and sisters are. And so the church's responsibility is to take care of our people, take care of us, take care of God's children. And so we are praising God that that's happening right now and that they'll be on the road to Louisiana, on the road, Mississippi and parts of Texas, be able to say, God loves you through something simple like a cleaning supply. And so we're so thankful for that. But the world that we live in, as we get closer to election time, things are getting crazier and nastier. And I'm sure some of you may not watch the news, but you have probably social media. And uh, you see just every single thing on there is like, can it get any worse, right? But God brings order in the chaos. And all throughout Scripture, through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, you see where it's like, this is going to be the end. There's nowhere else left to go. But God, who is rich in mercy, he shows up and he does the unthinkable. He does the unthinkable and the impossible in those moments. And I just wanted to read one of my favorite verses in Psalm chapter 57. And this is where David, when he fled from Saul and he's in the cave. So he has fear in his heart. He's trying to figure out how am I anointed king, but yet I'm running for my life. I thought my path was supposed to go this way towards God and what he had for me. But I'm hiding out in a cave, scared for my life and what to do next. And he says, be gracious to me, God. Be gracious to me, for I take refuge in you. And I will seek refuge in the shadow of your wings until danger passes. It's a great place to be. I call to God most high. And this is the key right here. To God who fulfills his purpose for me. Not my purpose for me, but God's purpose for me. And that's, we should all be asking that. What is your purpose for me in tragedy what is your purpose for me in disaster what is your purpose to me our pastor has been talking about we don't run away from disaster god has called us to run to it and bring light in those dark places and so with that we have freedom when we take refuge under his wing we have freedom and we have god himself and that's something to be celebrated amen and so with that something to be celebrated, we should sing a song of celebration to be reminded. So you're going to know this song pretty well, I think. I praise God for Joe Langley. Um, he is a, a worship pastor at a sister church here locally. And on these nights, he's able to come in and lead worship with us. We've been so blessed to have him. And so we're just going to kind of break it down a little bit and have a little old school church for the next two songs, if that's okay. All right, here we go.
watching online there's a party going on in the house of God tonight so we're going to continue that as Blythe leads us with how deep the father's love for us Church, pray with me this morning. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We praise you and we thank you for everything this week, for the things that we don't recognize, for the things that we do, for the roofs over our heads. It's a major blessing for us. We praise you for that. Thank you for this church opening their heart, their wallets, their eyes to see the needs of the brothers and sisters in states next to us. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that the church is active and moving and though the world may be dark, you are so much more brighter, Father. We give you praise for that this morning. We thank you so much. 
I love that song. I love singing that song. I love singing truth and be reminded today that the compassion that you, Jesus, had for us was a compassion that came deep from within, according to the Greek in Matthew, came from deep within your innermost. So, Lord, let us joyfully approach the throne this morning with our prayers and our petitions and our praise, knowing that you're a God that listens and deeply cares. Thank you so much for showing us over and over how good you are. Open our eyes to the things that we need to see this morning in the word. And all God's people said, amen. Open your Bibles to Acts 27. And what we're going to find together is Acts 27 provides one of the great adventure stories in all of Scripture. It's a story with all kinds of action, shipwrecks, uh, uh, storms, hurricanes. Uh, it's a, it's a just bristling with activity and energy. And it is such a beautiful picture of how God's people are to behave in a storm. It's a great picture of how God's people are to behave in a storm. And we're watching storm clouds gather all around us. And I've been trying to challenge you as we've walked through the book of Acts together, that rather than people being people who shrink back when the storms get rough, we are to be people who look for the hand of God and the opportunities for the gospel in the midst of the storm. That's what it means to be the body of Christ. Luke, the author of Acts, is also the author of the gospel of Luke. And in that gospel, he allows us to see the body of Christ. And then in the book of Acts, he shows us how to be the body of Christ. And so this story has been building all the way through. And chapter by chapter, we've come to see together how it is that God's people can respond in the midst of adversity and watch God use them to show forth the gospel that it's difficulty and hardship and storms that actually push the church through barrier after barrier after barrier to take the good news of Jesus Christ to the whole world. And really the story of the gospel is the story of God's son facing the greatest adversity that any human being has ever faced. All of the sin of the whole world poured out upon him, the very wrath of God. And Jesus, fully human, fully divine at the same time, willingly stands in the gap for us. And his willingness to walk towards the disaster of human sin and open himself up to that suffering on our behalf throws open the gates to our salvation and calls us to that same kind of life. And so we're gonna learn through this whole book and we're gonna learn as the book of Acts draws to a conclusion only one more chapter uh, after uh, the story of this shipwreck. And it's a storm that blows Paul all the way to Rome. And we leave Paul at the end of the book of Acts in Rome under arrest, preaching the gospel unhindered. That's what storms do in the lives of Christians. And so we've been really learning to, to, to be the body of Christ. And we've been looking at that from a variety of angles through Acts. And now I just want to give you some very practical instruction. We have this very vivid story. We get to watch the Apostle Paul frame by frame as he actually responds in the midst of a crisis. And we can draw some principles out, his, out of his life so that whatever storm you're walking through right now, you can learn to walk in that storm as Paul does, as, as, as people of God do. And what you see in this story of Paul's uh, journey through this storm, there's a sense in which it's a death and resurrection. It's a picture of Paul's willingness to lay his life down. And it shows how the, the very life of Christ is to be superimposed over the life of every believer. So our lives look like Jesus and there's a dying and rising. There's a, there's a dying to live 
plot line to our lives. And when we do that, God uses us to bring great redemption. What we learn in the last part of verse 44, you just, we're going to look at the whole chapter uh, together. But in, in verse 44 of chapter 27, the back half of that verse says this, and it so happened that they were all brought safely to land. And we're gonna learn that all of them is 200 and, 276 people survived the shipwreck and are brought safely through because of Paul's obedience. And here's my question. How many people are being brought safely through the storm because of you? When you get to the end of your life, will you be able to name 276 people who found redemption and salvation, who watched you and, 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 and found the very Christ that filled your life and found in him the one who could bring them through their storms as well? That's how we want our story to end, is that uh, we have uh, walked through the storm and we have brought others in our wake. How many people are seeing how Christ brings us through the storms because of your life? And so here's what's going on real quickly. Paul has been arrested in Jerusalem, and he's been arrested basically because of his witness for Christ. Put on trial in Jerusalem, put on trial in Caesarea, and he has appealed to Caesar. It's kind of a, they've sort of, um, uh, 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 trials that were shams that he had been through. And so finally he says, I want to make my case to Caesar himself. And so Paul is put on a ship, basically in a, in a coastal city of Israel, and he's going to begin to make his way under arrest He's going to make his way by ship all the way from the land of Israel all the way to Rome where he, will, where he will appear before Caesar. But on the way, a great storm, a hurricane, a, a northeaster that's, uh, as it's known in that part of the world comes roaring in and, and essentially blows his ship uh, uh, out into the middle of the Mediterranean. They're lost. They don't know where they are. And for two weeks, the ship is being pounded and battered and driven breaking apart. They try to tie the ship together. They throw all of the cargo overboard. They're, they're uh, uh, beginning to lose hope. But Paul, all along the way, we're going to see him at critical moments intervening. And so as the ship is bl blown back towards the, uh, the, the, the area of Greece, the ship breaks apart. And, and Paul leads them uh, uh, out of the sea and onto dry land. And every single person, as Paul predicted through the Holy Spirit, every single person is saved. And what you're going to see in this story is that the right response to losses in the storm results in redemptive impact. The right response to losses in the storm results in redemptive impact. One of the things you're going to really see in this passage, and I, we won't get to do every verse, so I hope you'll read it, because you really see Paul giving a, a, a crash course in leadership. If you want to be a person of influence, and every single Christian is called to be a person of influence, to use how God has made and gifted and crafted them to influence and draw others towards Christ. And so it's a great lesson on leadership. And what I want you to see is not only Paul going through a physical storm of this hurricane that basically comes blowing in, but Paul, Paul is also in a personal storm. He's a prisoner. He is under arrest. He's in chains. He's lost everything. And so it's a loss within a loss. And yet Paul's response becomes a gateway for salvation. And how about you? You wanted to let God use the storm that you're in, the difficulty that you're in, the difficulty that we are in together to be a gateway for redemption. I want you to see five things real quickly that we're gonna learn from this text. First thing I want you to see is we seek to have redemptive impact in the lives of others is I want you to see the impact of faithfulness. It's the impact of faithfulness that redeems lost standing. It's the impact of faithfulness that redeems lost standing. Standing In verse 3 of chapter 27, we, we've, uh, we're introduced to a centurion named Julius. 
Julius is the, is the head military guy that's in charge of this whole ship and this whole voyage, and he's in charge of the prisoners, and therefore he is in charge of Paul. But we learn that as they're making their way there in the ship in verse 3 of chapter 27, and Luke is writing here in the first person, so Luke is, is eyewitness to this story. He was a part of the shipwreck. And in verse 3, it says, the next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius, that's the centurion, that's the Roman soldier, Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friend and receive care. Already, the early going of this trip, Paul is making a difference in the life of this hardened Roman soldier, this centurion. Now, here's what we know about centurions. They were men uh, kind of like a, a master sergeant. They were men who understood how to be under authority and how to give direction as well. And they knew how to spot a man with character. They wanted to fight alongside men they could count on. And, and this word, again, in verse three, it says he treated Paul with consideration. It's the, word, it's the same word we use, the same Greek word where we get the, the idea of philanthropy. And philanthropy in Greek speaks of the qualities that make human beings truly special. And as Julius has been just observing Paul, this prisoner, watching his life, watching his words. And I believe he sees in Paul these Christ-like qualities of truth and love and courage. A man who has stuck to his guns and stayed true to his beliefs, even under very difficult circumstances. And Julius sees that and he's impressed by it. That's a guy who can be trusted. And so yeah, I'll let him go see his friends because he said he's gonna come back when we get ready to leave and continue our journey. I know he's a man of his word. And already a foundation is being laid that's going to be crucial to this story. You see, the world says that the good life is a life that's problem free. And so anybody who's having difficulty, they must be living life the wrong way. They must be doing something wrong. Everyone gets what they deserve. And so here's Paul, this prisoner who's lost everything. And yet his testimony is, if you'll read in Philippians chapter three, Paul's testimony is, I lost everything in order to find Christ. And I celebrate that. I needed to lose everything to find Christ and find in him everything I've been looking for. But these folks on this boat that have the value system of the world, they're looking at Paul. They're looking at his level of loss. He has nothing. And they've got this question on their mind. It's what every non-believer is thinking when they watch you go through a difficulty. Here's the question. Now, what are you gonna do? Now, what are you going to do? Is your Christianity only about what you get and what benefits you, how it makes things nice for you? What are you going to do in the midst of this failure or this loss or this disappointment? And Paul's testimony is, through the loss of worldly things, I found the only thing that can truly satisfy. And of course, all of this points to Jesus who before his accusers is one who is understood as, as sinless, as innocent. And over and over and over again, it says of Jesus as he's heading to the cross, the people, the centurions and the Roman soldiers, Pilate, the Roman gover governor, when they watch Jesus, they're amazed by him. And do you remember what the Roman soldier says at the foot of the cross? As he watches how Jesus dies, what does he say? Surely, surely this is God's son. And so impact decision number one, as you're walking through a loss, here's a question. What if I lost everything? What if I lost everything the world values? Health and wealth and ease and prosperity, popularity. What if I lost everything? Would my faith be lost as well? Or would my faithfulness be on display? Because my hope is not in anything other than Christ and Christ alone. And see, mature Christianity works through that question. I love what Job says. Y'all know the story of Job. Job lost everything, and he is battling this question. And even his wife has said, just curse God and die. You're at the bottom. You've lost everything. Clearly, God hates you. Just give up. And here's what Job says, one of my favorite verses, Job chapter 23, verses 8 through 10. He says, essentially, I go to the north, I can't find you. I go to the south, you're not there. I go to the east and the west, you're hidden from me. God, I don't, I don't know where you are, but you know where I am. I 
I know you know where I am. And when you've brought me through this, I'll be refined like gold. He'll say a little bit later, I know my Redeemer lives. I can't see him. I can't feel him. I can't tell what he's doing right now. But as you heard me say before, you don't know Jesus is all you have until Jesus is all you got. And that's what's on display. And that has a redemptive power. A man who had lost all of his standing is being faithful and people are taking notice. Secondly, you need to see the impact of conviction when the truth is lost. Look at verses nine and 10. So they're, they're making their way along and they're kind, of, they're kind of going from locale to locale and they've even changed ships. And verse nine says, when a considerable time had passed, the voyage was now dangerous since even the fast was already over. What that means is the, the uh, day of atonement has already come and gone. It's winter time. And you do not want to be in the Mediterranean and on a first century boat in the winter. It's dangerous. Paul began to admonish them. The prisoner Paul warns them. In verse 10, he says, men, I perceive the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Now, here's here's what I want you to catch. Paul is not revealing some spiritual truth here. He's just revealing an obvious objective truth. This is a bad time to sail. Everyone knows that's why there's no other boats out here. We're doing the wrong thing. But look on, verse 11 says, the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by by Paul. Verse 12, because the harbor was not suitable for wintering, probably means it didn't have this awesome town in there where everybody could hang out and go to parties and gamble and do other stuff. The majority reached the decision to put out to sea from there if somehow they could not reach Phoenix, and it's just a little town, uh, a, a harbor of Crete facing southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. Verse 13, and when a moderate south wind came up, supposing they had attained to their purpose, they weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete close to inshore. And so here's the deal. The second thing I need you to see is the impact of conviction redeems lost truth. A second thing that's been lost here is just objective truth. All of these people should have known that they were making a wrong decision by continuing to sail in the winter. They were putting everything at risk But here's what the world does. The world puts its finger in a gentle south wind and says, ah, everything's perfect right now. And it was popular and it was profitable and it was pleasurable and it made sense to them. And so who cares what objective truth says? I'm just going to do what I want to do right now. It's a voyage that would have taken a couple of hours if it had been a different time of year. But Paul simply points out an unpopular truth and the majority rules. And so, even in this loss, the loss of status means nobody's listening to Paul. And here's what the world says to Christians. Why in the world should we listen to you? Why in the world should we listen to you? And especially when you're going through a time of loss and difficulty. Oh, this Christianity thing hasn't brought you health, wealth, and fame. Why should we listen to you? You don't have any of the things These sailors say to Paul, you don't have any of the things that make the world go around. But Paul's fundamental commitment, again, is that he's lost everything in order to find the only thing that really matters. And he's spoken the truth even when it's unpopular. So that he's able to say, after the storm hits, if you look in verse 21, it says, but Paul, when Paul... uh, uh, Verse 21 of chapter 28 says, when they had gone a long time without food. So they, they, the storm lasts about two weeks and it's horrible. They're probably all seasick. They've been uh, in the midst of this hurricane for two weeks when they'd gone a long time without food. Paul stood up in their midst and said, men, you ought to have followed my advice. Not have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Paul isn't just doing a game of I told you so. But he's laid a foundation as a truth teller. And because he spoke the truth when it was unpopular, he's earned the right to speak the truth and be trusted in the midst of the storm. We see this commitment to telling the truth all the way through Jesus' life. Even when he's asked as he's getting ready to go to the cross by, by another Roman ruler, Pilate, are you really the king? Jesus says, you got that right. The truth that took him to the cross. But a willingness to tell.
tell the truth when truth has been lost lays a foundation for influence. A second impact question for you is this. Will I courageously speak the truth in love? Courage, truth, and love. If those three things that are lived out and made possible by the life of Christ could become your value system, you're gonna change the world. Here's the question. As we are surrounded in a world that constantly lies about everything, are you gonna be the person that courageously tells the truth in love. Remember, you haven't told the truth until you've told the truth in love, until you've told a truth that caused people to find redemption. In your relationships, at work, at school, when the lies abound, will you be someone who lives a life of impact because your word is trusted as it? being married to truth. The third leadership principle that we see in Paul's life is the impact of vision that redeems lost hope. The impact of vision redeems lost hope. Look at verse 22. Paul again is speaking here and he says, now I urge you to keep, keep up your courage for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of this ship. For this very night, an angel of God, of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood before me, saying, don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe, God, that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on a certain island. In the midst of the storm, when everything is going wrong, and the lies of the world start to fall away, and the consequences of of pursuing the wrong things begin to play out. But you've been willing, consistent in telling the truth, even when it's been hard, then you're gonna have an opportunity to cast vision. To not only speak of objective truth, but to point people to ultimate truth. Paul says, I've got some good news for you real quickly. Let me tell you about the gospel. Let me tell you about the God I serve. Let me tell you about his plans for me and his plans for you. Let me tell you about this God who wants to make himself known in this ship and all around the world. Let me tell you about a God who speaks. He speaks very clearly and very specifically. And he's related to me what we need to do. Do you have a relationship where God can speak to you with that kind of specificity where your heart is open because a vision of Christ has become your vision? You see, the world had gotten to a place of hopelessness. Look at verse 20, it says, since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, no small storm was assailing us. From then, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. That's what's gonna, that's what's already happening and that's what's going to happen in the coming days, weeks, months, and years in our culture. This isn't gonna work. What we're up to is not gonna work. Our destruction of everything true It's gonna fall, it's already falling apart and people are gonna lose hope. Already suicide rates are skyrocketing. People don't know which way to turn. We've kicked the foundation away from the the, the fundamental functioning of our society and and everything is, is on fire. People are losing hope. But it is into that hopelessness that we speak vision. Paul is able to say, yes, again, I lost all those false hopes long ago. Let me tell you about the truth, Christ alone. Jesus, appearing before Pilate, basically saying, just keep watching me. I'm gonna open the doorway to salvation for all. And so here's impact decision number three. Impact decision number three is this. Can I articulate a gospel vision? in the midst of hopelessness? Am I ready? Am I equipped? Have I been living faithfully? Have I earned the right? Do I know the truth and can I share it? And when people are caught in the grasp of hopelessness, can I give a gospel vision? Can I hear a specific word? And do I have the courage to share it? You see, Paul does a whole lot more than just say, I told you so. There's a whole lot of I told you so Christians. We're really glad when everything blows up in people's faces, often very glad to come along and say, I told you that was gonna happen, but we don't tell them the rest of the truth. 
We don't tell them the, the fullness of the story. And so Paul says, I've got good, for you, good news for you. Even though we blew it, even though you made a huge mistake, even though you did something you knew to be wrong, and now the consequences are coming, the story's not over. You're going to be saved. You're going to be saved because the God I serve loves to redeem. Fourthly, we need to see the impact, how the impact of authority redeems lost unity. When things start to really fall apart, people start to turn on one another. We start to fly away from one another. And so look at verse 30. It says, but the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's little boat. You know what a dinghy is? We're, we're sort of near the, the water, so I'm sure you do that. But it's a, there's the big boat and there's a the little boat. And things are going so badly, and the soldiers know it. They know what bad shape the ship is in, and so they know they need to get off. And so they're trying to sneak off the ship, get in the dinghy, and get out of there before the whole ship is destroyed and sinks. Verse 30, but the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from below. And Paul says to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. And the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship, the ship's boat, and let it fall away. Paul's saying here, essentially, we all need each other. We're in this thing together. Every single person is necessary. Every single person is required. And we're going we're gonna to walk through this storm together. Nobody gets to float off on their own. We're going to stay together. We're going to watch out for one another. Because every single person is valuable and important and has a role to play. You see, the world says to each his own. The world says everybody just figure out your own solution for yourself and maybe a handful of people that you like. But Paul's losses had taught him that it's just not about me and it's not about what I want and it's not about what I get and it's not about what benefits me. Paul had become a person that we meet in the early going of this book and, and we realize Paul didn't care about anybody. A transformation had occurred through the, the loss of the things that are valued in this world. Paul began to love people with a radical love so that in every single letter he'll write as we read the rest of the New Testament, Paul cares way more about people than he cares about things. And Paul lays down his prayer request. He prays for people and not things. He prays for people and not his own comfort. Because Paul's vision and desire for every single person to be saved and every single person to find in, in Christ their true calling, to join in the mission, to see God's purpose and God's gospel go out to the whole world. The gospel calls us to always look for the stragglers. That's Jesus' story. That's Jesus' life. He looked for Zacchaeus. He loved little kids to come to him. And every single time somebody would try to disrupt that, Jesus would speak with authority and say, no, I want those people. You make sure they get to me. And so it's with authority that Paul says, here's the deal. It's all of us together. And so impact decision number four is this. Is there somebody that you've written off? Somebody that you're watching, getting ready to get into the little dinghy and sail away from you and sail away from responsibility, sail away from what God is doing. And if you got into the place in your life where you say, fine, let them go, forget them. They're on their own. Passion of our Savior is even the one out of a hundred at the very center of his heart and he rejoices over that one. And so if we're gonna be impactful people, we've gotta have our eye on those that are getting away. Eye on those that can't be trusted that nobody wants. That's gotta be our top priority. It was for Paul. And our authority, our, our passion, our insistence is that no one is written off. And then finally, we need to understand the impact of compassion and how it redeems lost strength. Here's the thing about storms. Some storms you're in, anybody ever been in a storm that just went on and on and on and on? Seemed like the rain would never stop. The winds would never quit blowing. This thing goes on for two weeks. Anybody been seasick before? You've had the experience of being 
Seasick, yeah? Fun, it's pleasant. I got seasick on a merry-go-round one time. I've never actually gotten, been far enough out on a boat to get seasick on a boat. But man, it must have been awful on this ship. It must have been quite a scene of two weeks of bouncing around in the middle of the Mediterranean. These people had lost hope. They hadn't eaten anything. And, and what people very often need as the storm goes on and on and on is just some compassion. Just a little bit of compassion. And so look at verse 33. Luke writes, until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them to take some food, saying, today is the 14th day that you've been constantly watching and going without e eating, having taken nothing. Therefore, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation, for not a hair on your head, the hair on your head of any of you will perish. Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all, and he broke it and he began to eat, and all of them were encouraged, and they themselves also took food. All of us in the ship were 276 persons, and when they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing the wheat into the sea. There's probably a temptation through all of Paul's losses to be real focused on his mission. Hey, we gotta, we gotta get this thing to the, to, to the shoreline. I gotta get off this boat. I got things I've gotta do. I've gotta get on to Rome. Come on, you guys hurry up. Quit lazing about. Quit acting like you're sick. And Paul certainly, by, by nature, I think was a, a pushy person. But because of his relationship with Christ, he knows when it's time to just have some compassion on people. Where he can say to them, rest. Let's rest for a little bit. Let's worship for a little bit. Let's talk to the Lord. See about some of those physical needs. Just get something to eat. Does the Lord suffer with them? Again, shares the gospel with them, breaks the bread of Christ. Because the world is always pushing. The world is always saying, look, if you work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, never take a break, you can fix all your own problems. Paul had come to understand through his losses, I can't fix any problem on my own. I can't fix any problem in my own strength. And so let's trust in the Lord. Let's cut each other some slack. Let's have a little compassion Let's pay attention to what's going on with other people. When they look green around the gills, when they haven't had anything to eat in two weeks, maybe they just need somebody to care about them, see about their needs, pull up a chair and sit across the table from them. Show them that we care. This again is Christ all the way through. Even on the cross, he looks at the thief and he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Even as he's suffering on the cross, he's looking to bring comfort and care and compassion to someone else. He looks on these people that hate his guts and says, Father, forgive them. Bring them into a relationship with yourself. They don't really know what they're doing. All the way through a heart of compassion. When people's strength and hope is broken. And so impact decision number five is this. Do people care how much I know or do they know how much I care? We fall into this trap in these days in the storm of being real good at being able to lay out everything we know as if that and that alone is gonna win people, draw people into a relationship with Christ. But they don't really care about what you know until they know you care about them. There's never been a greater need for compassion there's no been a greater challenge to compassion. But that's what they need to see in us. And so right here, right before salvation comes, when the things are darkest, Paul reaches out in compassion, reminds them God has a plan for you. And 276 persons, every single one, comes through the storm and finds salvation. That ought to be what our lives look like. 1945, as World War II was winding down to a conclusion, the USS Indianapolis was struck by a torpedo and very quickly began to sink. Most of the men aboard the ship died instantly. Many of the men find them, found themselves in a process of having to evacuate off of that ship and for four days, 
Hundreds of those men were bobbing in the Pacific Ocean waiting to be rescued. And when the rescue ship finally arrived, 317 men were saved. And most of them would say it was because of one lowly ensign named Harlan Twibble. Harlan Twibble, what an ordinary name. But they would tell stories, first of all, how it was Harlan the one. Harlan was the one. Even though he was lowly, he took command. Even though he was a nobody, he took command. All the commanding officers were gone, probably killed, and he began to give orders. Secondly, even out of that humility and willingness to serve and faithfulness to his task, he gave them some instruction. You've got to get off this boat now. I know everything inside you says you should stay, but we got to get off this boat. We got to get off now spoke the truth to him, even though it was hard. Laid out for him a vision. Here's what we need to do. Here's what the plan is gonna be. Called into unity. It was scary. There were sharks all around. It was frightening. There was always this impulse to push away from one another, especially the guys that were sick and hurt, couldn't contribute. There's always an impulse just to cut those guys loose. Harlan Twibble said, we're better off if we stick together. And then you just encouraged them. As the guy started to lose hope, no one's gonna come. Four days in the ocean, four days being surrounded by those Mako sharks, sent some guys right over the edge psychologically. And there was Harlan, gonna make it, gonna come, hang on a little bit longer, hang on to one another. And 317 men pulled alive out of that terrible disaster. Because one man knew how to have a redemptive impact. So much more for those of us who through the power of Christ and through the witness of Paul become those who say yes to the call to lead people through the storms. I hope that you're finding that witness and power of Christ in your life in this day. Would you bow your heads with me? The first question, of course, is have you let Jesus deal with the storm of sin that every single human being confronts? Maybe you would admit tonight that you've been living according to your truth, under your authority, for your own purposes, with you at the center. And things are beginning to fall apart. And maybe tonight you could simply say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've made a mess. I'm lost. I can't see the stars. I can't, I can't get a point of reference. I don't know where I am. Can't find a bearing. Don't know my longitude or latitude. Don't know which way is up. I don't know where I am. God, but you do. And Jesus, I say yes to you being the captain of my life. Others of you you love Jesus, but you're not connected. You're not walking in unity with other believers. And so you're not really walking in the fullness of the impact. Jesus died and rose again to give you. And it's time to say, maybe in prayer, Lord, I want this church to be my church. Finally, there may be some of you here that love Jesus, you're a part of this church. You can't point to many people who have found their way through the storm because of you, because of your witness, your faithfulness, your love of the truth, your close walk with the Lord that results in gospel vision being cast over the lives of others. you don't have a heart for the stragglers that need to be pulled into unity because you don't have an eye of compassion for people who are just worn out. And so right where you're sitting, would you be willing to say, I want to be the body of Christ. I want to look like Christ looked and talk like he talked as he obediently gave his life for all. because he obediently gave his life for me. 
Father, I pray that we, your people, can be your hands and feet and voice in the midst of the storm that's raging around us, unafraid, filled with your word and your spirit. Walking in truth and in courage and in love. Bringing people through the storm. Help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so very much for being here. And if you made a decision to trust Christ or you want to know more about what it means to be a member of our church or you just have a struggle that you're walking through or spiritual issue you want, to, you want to know more about, or maybe there's a deep need in, in your life or in your family of some kind, please share that with us. There's a number on your screen. You can just give us a few words that indicate what your need is, and we'll respond to you with the love of Christ and the power of His Spirit. I do want to remind you that uh, we're, we're uh, moving forward with our uh, kind of re- normalizing things again. And so this uh, worship service will be at 11, back to its pre-COVID time. And we'll have worship at 8.30 and 11 and um, Sunday school uh, between the two. And then also be looking forward to a, to a slow return to our Wednesday night activities as well. It's gonna be good stuff. Well, again, I'm so glad uh, you've been uh, here in worship. And I pray that you'll walk into the storm with someone in the coming days.